It's remarkable the internal anatomy of virtually any tooth by position in the mouth. Through micro CT, we've learned through non-invasive procedures to better appreciate their root canal systems. And of course, when we're shaping canals, our instruments pretty much just follow the primary system. But in fact, it's good to appreciate that the shaping allows for irrigants to penetrate theoretically into all aspects of the root canal system. Many colleagues were trained to work short of the full working length and so a block is oftentimes related to the inability to pass a tin file to length. But I would like to bring your attention to another kind of block that happens every day in the big city. And in fact, instruments that shape canals commonly spin debris off into tubules, eccentricities off the rounder parts of canals and into anastomoses. In a simulated plastic block, you can see exactly how this works and every rotation of the instrument just provides deeper penetration of the dental mud. So there's a lot of factors that we need to appreciate that will influence disinfection. This is not a complete list and probably one of the most controversial things not on this list is one versus two visit endodontics. But let's get started and look at the anatomy. Well we just saw the spinning tooth and when you begin to see the anatomy in its entirety, it's a little sobering how we're going to get these things completely cleaned out and disinfected. But recall, the extraction is successful because it serves to remove 100% of the dental pulp. And the good news today is we can remove all the contents of the root canal system when we have some ideas. Of course, another variable or factor that will influence disinfection is complete access and finding all the orifices. There is a lot of different methods used to shape canals and prepare them for obturation, but since the late 1970s, I've always advocated using small size hand files in the upper two thirds of the canal, and once there's a glide path, we can shape that region of the canal. With better access into the apical one-third, we are now free to scout the apical one-third, establish working length and patency, and see if we have a glide path for rotary instruments to follow. Sequencing the preparation is a major factor influencing disinfection. Carrying small files to length initially means we're working virtually with no reagents in the root canal system. As I said earlier in this show, many students internationally have been taught to work to the cementum dentinal junction. This is a rather arbitrary reference point, and so as such, most schools have just taught working about a millimeter short. But we all know when we don't work to the full working length, mud accumulates, and over a series of a few files and a little bit of time, we end up even working shorter than was our intention. So it's important to negotiate the full length of canals and have a glide path to the radiographic terminus. Even the cross section of a file will directly dictate how much mud is produced, if the mud is picked up more effectively on the instrument, or if the debris is more likely burnished into the lateral anatomy. In a cutting instrument, they cut cleaner they pick up debris more effectively and they don't tend to burnish debris as much as a radial landed instrument. So radial landed instruments or modified landed instruments more effectively burnish debris and this was more or less the first generation of files that launched back in the early 1990s. There's significant controversy even regarding canal preparation. There's basically two schools of thought one school of thought thinks we need to take the terminal parts of canals up to a minimum size 40 file. They advocate we do this for two reasons, to make them rounder and to help us exchange irrigant more effectively. The other school of thought wants to keep the foramen as small as anatomically practical. And in this school of thought, there is more emphasis on deep shape. It has been shown by Baumgartner in the Journal of Endodontics that there's no statistically significant difference between a 4006 preparation and a 2010. The irrigants we use will directly affect our ability to disinfect and clean root canal systems. 
Obviously, 6% sodium hypochlorite has been found to be the ideal concentration to allow us to debride. If we increase the temperature of sodium hypochlorite to 60 degrees centigrade, we'll reduce our digestion times from about 28 minutes to 12 and a half minutes. And of course, the frequency that we replenish reagent into the pulp chamber will also influence disinfection and of course the volume that is dispensed each time we irrigate. We've been using irrigation devices for probably more or less 30 to 40 years and they haven't changed but in recent years you've seen the introduction of nickel titanium cannulas and these of course are more flexible and encourage colleagues to place their cannulas deeper into shape canals. The cannula on the left is in delivery that's what I use because if one keeps their hand moving, they're not going to have Clorox accidents. The cannula on the right is a side port delivery, and that's for those colleagues who tend to maybe more aggressively irrigate than they need to. There's been tremendous interest internationally on active irrigation because activating reagents allows them to move into the deep lateral anatomy. Passive irrigation, on the other hand, the solutions in the tooth just stay still. They're not really moving and it would take a significant longer amount of chair time for a passive irrigation method to be complete. I imagine it is an indignity for most of you to have to look at an XY graph, but on occasion it can be useful. Here you see the formula streaming velocity or you might just think of streaming velocity as the potential to clean. You can see that cleaning then is directly proportional to the frequency. It's exponentially proportional to the amplitude and it's inversely proportional to the radius of the instrument. As such, some groups in the world are looking at high frequencies like ultrasonics to solve the cleaning problem. Other groups like myself are looking at amplitudes because amplitudes that are squared have a big, big impact on cleaning potential. Another thing we can do very quickly is just look at some of the distinguishing features between sonics and ultrasonics and you can see sonics are perceived to work relatively slow. That would be about 10,000 cycles per minute or 250 cycles per second. Whereas ultrasonics is well known to work up to 40,000 hertz or cycles per second. In sonics we have a single node and a single antinode. The antinode and node is very important because if we have multiple ones, then the instrument, when it touches dentin, tends to dampen its back and forth amplitude and render the instrument useless. This was described in Ahmad's famous paper as 2 alpha. So the angle of the tip goes far to the right like a pendulum, it swings back far to the left like a pendulum, and that full back and forth cycle is considered 2 alpha. We always get 2-alpha with sonics even when we touch dentin and we don't get the full 2-alpha and we have decreased benefits when we touch dentin with ultrasonics. We also have to be concerned about heat and then of course I've emphasized continuously in my writings and my lectures it's far safer to activate a soft polymer tip that won't cause iatrogenic problems versus a cannula or a solid metal file or even a file that is non-active. So in summary, when one chooses the best method for disinfection, one has to look at the price to get into the technology. They have to look at the per patient use and then what is that fee on a per patient basis. How easy is it to train up the assistants and the doctor to integrate this into an already successful technique and finally, what is the evidence behind the instrument that would justify its inclusion? I think it's pretty obvious from the research and from the safety that the endoactivator will play a major role in the future of endodontic disinfection.